Good afternoon. My name is Ed Thomas. Zach yuchatu esauk. Sean skidek yuchatu esauk. Skilkuidans in Haida. I'm very pleased to uh, be the moderator of this panel to talk about uh, the Southeast Alaska Native perspective on Alaska statehood. Uh, I got a bunch of slides that I'm going to go through, and I'll be going through them fairly quickly, so bear with me. Uh, I don't want to dwell on any topics just uh, in the interest of time, but I think the uh, background slides that I'm going to provide are very much important to the issue of our perspective on statehood. Uh, we also are going to be, uh, I'm also having a paper handed out. I did a research project for the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute, uh, which uh, comprised of uh, doing some uh, uh, academic research along with uh, some interviews. I tried to tie the two together into a single paper and uh, probably didn't do justice for either one, but the intent is not to uh, be a documentary on statehood, but simply to pro provoke people's thinking on the various topics that are under consideration by Alaska Natives when we talk about and think about statehood. So if you're looking for a uh, uh, end all to uh, the issue of our perspective on statehood, this paper is really not it. It's one of those to just kind of bring a, a number of topics together and uh, to, get, to bring forth some factual statements and then to uh, uh, provoke some thinking. Southeast Alaska is the home of the Slingit, the Haida, and the Zimsian people. Uh, we know it from the Tlingit side as Tlingit Ani, the ancestral home of the Tlingit people. Uh, many Tlingits feel that we've always been here, this has always been our homeland, that uh, the legend tells us that the raven was actually the creator. And uh, I'm one of those that believe that our ancestors are, uh, did not migrate across any land bridge. Uh, and why? Uh, you might be aware of the findings on Prince of Wales Island where uh, there are 10,000 year old human remains uh, found in a cave. And that takes us right back to the Ice Age. That, that is uh, fairly well documented, uh, you know, by people who study those things. And so therefore, it uh, uh, pretty much wiped out, the Ice Age pretty much wiped out any evidence of our being here uh, during that period of time. So there was really no findings uh, uh, on our lands that pre uh, predate uh, the Ice Age. And so uh, uh, many of our people uh, uh, legends go way back uh, even before the Ice Age. One thing I want to, uh, one thing I put up here on the slide presentation is the linguistic ties. Uh, when people migrate, like people came from Europe, they brought with them their language and they brought with them the dialects, the various dialects of the various languages. Uh, our languages here in uh, uh, the Western Hemisphere really do not have that many great ties linguistically to uh, those in Siberia. As a matter of fact, I think the Tlingit only has one uh, close uh, tie way up in uh, central Siberia. Uh, otherwise, uh, all of our languages over here are, are very much different than those in Asia. Tlingit and the Haida nations have always existed as two separate and distinct nations from the beginning of time. Legends have it that the uh, Haida migrated from Haida Gwaii, which is the uh, Queen Charlotte Islands in British Columbia. And this map here I copied uh, from work that uh, Andy Hope III uh, did, uh, and, and I, I believe this is research done on where our clans were uh, at time of contact, meaning when the non-natives first came to our land. And so you can see by looking at this map, Haida Gwaii is just south of, of uh, southeast Alaska and the migration of the Haida went into the southern uh, half of Prince of Wales Island. 
the Simsian that had, uh, there were some Simsians who were an old metal cattle that got relocated to an Ed Island in the 1800s and in 1891 was recognized as a reservation, uh, Indian reservation tribe. And uh, you can see by this map also, the Simsian country is a little bit broader uh, on the mainland and uh, I uh, start the arrow uh, down where old Metlakatla is uh, and uh, show the migration up to where Metlakatla currently is. Clinkett, Haida and Simsian people have always governed themselves. We didn't wait for people to come in from the outside before we start governing ourselves. And that's the definition of sovereignty. Sovereignty uh, really is thrown around a lot in political cycle, uh, political arenas. But the very simple definition of sovereignty is that the right of a distinct group of people to govern themselves. So what then is inherent sovereignty? Uh, it's those governing powers that, that those people governing themselves had from the beginning of time. And uh, they were never granted to them by other sovereigns. In uh, Clinkett and Haida country, uh, we believe that uh, our inherent sovereignty uh, comes from us following our ancient laws and our, our uh, spiritual relationship with the land and the waters as well as the air in our own region. Non-natives came to our land. Uh, uh, the Russians first came here uh, in 1741. Uh, the Clinket people made it very clear to the early Russian settlers that they were our guests on our land and they needed to have permission of the clans in order to uh, go about their business. Uh, in uh, 1867, uh, the Treaty of Sessions uh, uh, was passed and uh, uh, the United States bought Alaska. Uh, uh, the purchase was for $7.2 million. And just as the uh, Clinket people felt the Russians were our guests, they also felt that the uh, United States uh, people were guests on our land and they needed to have the same permissions from our clan leaders to go about their business. Very early on in occupancy, the uh, United States uh, uh, representatives in Alaska noticed the hostility that the Clinkets had towards their uh, occup occupation and governance. And uh, there were a lot of uh, small wars or battles between the Clinkets and the uh, United States armies. And uh, uh, many of you might be aware of the bombardments that took place in some of our villages. In 1908, the uh, Tongass National Forest was uh, uh, established and uh, Glacier, Bla Glacier Bay National Park was established in 1925, both uh, without the permission of the uh, uh, local people. And the United States was established as a territory by law in uh, 1912. Uh, and that was uh, coincidentally the time when our people decided to step up to the plate and fight for our, our own rights. That was the year the Alaska Native Brotherhood was organized in Sitka. The AMB continues to be the oldest uh, civil rights organization in the United States and it laid the foundation for uh, other minority groups to recognize the value of organization and unity in advocating on behalf of their rights. The Alaska Native Brotherhood uh, uh, was organized as a subsidiary to the AMB in uh, 1915 and was considered the backbone uh, because it was the organization that uh, went out and raised money and actually uh, uh, was able to keep the brothers going by uh, making sure they made it to meetings and things of that nature. They were an attraction to the meetings, I guess. Some of the things that the AMB uh, put on their own plate uh, uh, had to deal with the unequal uh, treatment of our people, not being able to attend public schools, not being recognized as citizens to own land, 
no right to vote, no right to hold office. Uh, they had no, form, no uh, voice in the formulation of policy. And uh, probably as important, the taking of our land without their permission. Uh, in 1922, uh, William Paul Sr. won uh, the right of our Alaska Natives to attend public schools in a lawsuit in Ketchikan. Prior to that time, uh, most Natives uh, attended only BIA schools. Uh, the BIA was successful in petitioning Congress uh, to uh, have our people recognized as citizens in 1924. That was very important because our people then were able to not only vote, but also hold office, or hold public office, the right to hold, own land. Uh, my my uh, late uncle Frank, along with many others, uh, did, as a matter of fact, hold uh, public office uh, in the territorial days. Uh, and uh, so it was really uh, uh, an interesting phenomenon because he tells a story and John Hope also told me a similar story that uh, in the early days when they first got involved in uh, uh, partisan politics, uh, the, uh, the brothers would get together and they would say, well, gee whiz, we got to make sure we have uh, people involved as uh, Democrats and we need to have some as Republicans. So they went through a process of deciding who was going to be Democrats and Republicans so that they would have representation in both parties. And uh, I know my uncle was, uh, uh, had very strong democratic ideals, but he was a Republican. And uh, he stayed a Republican all, all the way through his political life. In 1929, at the Haines Convention, uh, the, uh, the Alaska Native Brotherhood decided to sue the federal government for the taking of our land. Keep in mind that this was just five years after we gained citizenship. And so there really was a uh, mixed feeling amongst our people uh, because there was a fear that if uh, we sued the government, uh, we'd be compromising citizenship. Uh, because the only way you can sue the government uh, is that if you claim aboriginal title to the land. And so uh, there was some fear that uh, we would uh, compromise our citizenship. Uh, there also, they also was a fear that we would all be placed on one reservation as what happened in Lower 48. And so therefore, when they did pass the resolution in uh, 1929, it was by a very close vote. Uh, not 50-50, but uh, very close to that. I already talked about this, uh, that uh, we, we were uh, not able to sue as uh, individual citizens. We had to have... Uh, tribes sue the government for Aboriginal claim. And so therefore, once again, the AMB uh, got busy and they lobbied Congress uh, uh, to recognize uh, our people uh, that were suing the government as a tribe. And so in 1935, uh, the uh, Clinton Haida uh, was recognized as a tribe for those purposes. Most of you are aware that within our region, we also have IRA tribes. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, Click and Haida Act was uh, passed in 1935, but in 1934, in the lower 48, uh, uh, there was the Indian Reorganization Act uh, came into effect for recognizing uh, tribes nationwide in the lower 48. Uh, the AMB uh, lobbied Congress again and that act was amended in 1936. And, uh, and that, uh, when our people, I mean, our uh, IRA tribes uh, were able to uh, be recognized as tribes. Uh, most of the IRA tribes, uh, particularly in our, our region, were formulated in the late 1930s and early 1940s, uh, but they were dormant until the 19. Uh, uh, 75 Self-Determination Act was passed. Uh, this act was a very important act because it uh, required that federal agencies contract with tribes. Uh, heretofore, uh, tribes could contract, but the government was not required to. Uh, this act made it, sure, uh, made it uh, definite or made it a requirement that the federal government contract with the tribe if it wanted to contract for the services uh, that were provided for their people. 
Uh, the one problem that uh, Alaska had uh, when this law was passed is uh, there was not a uh, clear definition as to who really would be a tribe because uh, uh, if you look at the date you'd see that uh, ANCSA had just been passed uh, several years prior to this act and so there was a, a big debate uh, whether uh, 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 ANCSA tribes or some other vehicle uh, should be a tribe. Even at the A and B level uh, we had a big debate in Haines that uh, the, maybe the A and B should be the tribe. And so we had a big uh, uh, debate there. We had a resolution actually drafted that the A and B be recognized as a tribe, but it failed. And so what the, uh, the Bureau of Indian Affairs did is they came back with uh, what's called the order of precedence. The order of precedence uh, was simply a uh, listing of who would be recognized first for the purposes of 93638 contracting. The first order of precedence, of course, was the IRA tribes. If there was no IRA tribe, then a traditional tribe. And uh, Click and Haida at that time was recognized as a traditional tribe. Third was an ANCSA village corporation. Uh, and fourth was a regional ANCSA corporation. It's very important to understand that uh, in the definition of the 638 Act, ANCSA corporations are mentioned but it's this order of precedence that uh, uh, makes sure that uh, the IRA tribes at the local level have first uh, 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 priority for contracting and then the ANCSA corporations would be, uh, have the lower precedence. I'm gonna quickly cover statehood. Uh, the statehood movement actually began way back in 1912 uh, when the uh, political leaders of our territory were not very happy uh, with uh, the uh, uni uh, the United States uh, treatment of our territory, uh, our our political leaders thought uh, there should be more power. Our people should have better representation in Congress, etc. Uh, and so there were some people who were pushing for statehood way back in 1912. Of course, uh, uh, we ended up in the middle of a land struggle. Um, early proposals. Uh, included language that would have uh, prohibited native reservations in Alaska or Indian reservations. Now the A and B uh, uh, realized that uh, uh, they needed to have such language uh, existing in law in order to claim Aboriginal uh, title to, to our lands. And so they vigorously opposed uh, any of the uh, bills that went forth that prohibited uh, Indian reservations uh, in Alaska. They did so even knowing that most of our people did not want to be put on a reservation. Fisheries was a very important uh, topic uh, to our people in southeast Alaska at that time. Uh, most of our people were either fishermen or had family members that worked in canneries or other parts of the fishing industry. And so fisheries was very important. But one very important thing uh, uh, was is that the canneries uh, under federal control had uh, pretty much run of, the, run of the mill, if you may. They did whatever they wanted to uh, in our region. Uh, they had many, many fish traps uh, on every uh, important uh, migratory path, though there was a fish trap. And uh, those fish traps were not only depleting the uh, fisheries quite rapidly, they were also deteriorating the prices that were paid to our people in that particular industry. And so the promise of statehood was one that uh, promised to get rid of uh, fish traps. In uh, the territorial days, as I mentioned earlier, native children attended BIA school for the most part. And uh, the uh, You'll see in my paper there was a comment uh, about uh, the uh, BIA control. It was very insensitive uh, to the local desires of uh, our, our people in those uh, local communities. Uh, they pretty much dictated everything from Washington, D.C. And so the promise of statehood uh, was also attractive to those who wanted to run their own schools through school boards uh, as they're run now. 
And, uh, and uh, while things are better, I think most of you will agree uh, that uh, there is still uh, major disparities between the quality and quantity of education in rural communities as to those that exist in urban centers. I'm going to just quickly breeze through this. Uh, there were seven, uh, two of the seven members of the Constitutional Committee were Alaska Natives. Uh, however, only one of the 50 delegates uh, that attended the Alaska Constitutional Convention were natives, so we lost ground in that area. Uh, only one native was appointed by Governor Palin to serve on the 50-year celebration of statehood, and only four natives were invited to that 50-year cele celebration of the Constitutional Convention. Uh, and the Alaska Constitution does not officially include Alaska Native tribes uh, in any part of it. I talk about racism a little bit here because racism is one of those things that is uh, difficult to talk about, but it, ha it plays a very major role in the development of policy, particularly in this state. Uh, in the early days of uh, non-native occupancy of our region, racism was pretty uh, open. Uh, people did not hide their racial feelings. Uh, 1945, anti-discrimination helped suppress that. Uh, we know that uh, racism still exists, but it's not quite as open as it was way back then. Uh, just uh, one example that I bring forth on my slide is the issue of subsistence. Uh, we know that uh, subsistence utilization uh, is only about 1% of Alaska's resources that are fish or wildlife or both. But it consumes most of the political uh, capital that natives have in advocating for uh, rights in the state government. And uh, you can say, well, gee whiz, uh, it's a very divisive issue, but why? It doesn't really have to be when we're only talking about 1% of the total resources that are used by uh, sports or commercial enterprises. And uh, as I started out by saying, racism does, as a matter of fact, influence the formulation of policy in Alaska. Uh, statehood has really been good for Alaska. We have, uh, instead of one representative, as we did in territorial days in Congress, we have three. We got rid of fish, crap, fish traps. That was a slip of the tongue, by the way, fish traps. Uh, local school boards uh, uh, do control their education. We have school boards running schools now. Uh, we have an Alaska leg legislative uh, process, uh, and we do have natives serving in the Alaska legislature. We have local governance through our municipalities, and we did benefit uh, from the oil. Uh, the impact on Alaska natives, uh, one good thing is that uh, uh, statehood did stimulate the uh, settlement of our claims. Uh, I won't get into that whole uh, issue, but it did stimulate it. Uh, fishing regulations are uh, uh, developed locally. That's good or bad, depending on where you live. I know that uh, people in Huna wouldn't totally agree because one of the things that happened is Indian Islands got shut down under state control, and, uh, and the people who were highliners uh, by fishing Indian Islands pretty much lost their livelihood. They tried to do that to us out there uh, in Prince of Wales also. They tried to shut down uh, our area, but we were able to claim that it was a traditional fishery. Uh, once again, uh, the state government does not recognize tribes. Uh, we understand there's some legislation that's going to do that right now. Uh, uh, the subsistence is still an issue. A uh, percentage of natives uh, employed in state government agencies is very small, uh, certainly not up to the, uh, the uh, e equal or the uh, ratio of our citizenry. Uh, when I say a democracy is compromised, what I mean by that is that uh, in a good democracy, you would have people that were elected to represent uh, the entire state. But what is happening in our state, the urban centers that have the most power, they go to the state legislature and advocate for urban issues. They do not 
represent the entire state. In a true democracy, they would be concerned about the disparity in education and they would do something about it. But when they go to Juneau, or they come to Juneau, they look out after their own interests and therefore our democracy ends up becoming compromised. Uh, we are uh, in the middle of a urban-rural divide and uh, from many of our perspectives, particularly mine, I think it's getting worse. You might say, well, it's getting better, but watch the budget when we have a, a budget crunch. You'll see more and more uh, of the resources staying in urban centers and less to our, our villages. Statehood was good for Alaska, but not good for everybody all the time. Bottom line, maybe the kick studies should have had stricter immigration policies. We would have been way better off. Gunas <laughs> thank you for your kind attention. Um, I hope that uh, you'll get some more information from our other panelists. My name is Ed Thomas, and I approve this message. <laughs> I'll now turn it over to Peter Metcalf. I got involved in this um, about a year ago when uh, Andy Hope and I and my sister Kim went to a, um, a meeting at the A&B Hall that was called by Las the Alaska uh, um, the Alaska Humanities Forum to discuss the Statehood Experience Grant. The forum had been given a million dollars by the Rasmussen Foundation and were accepting grants for, um, for the Statehood Experience to explore that in many, many facets. Um, some of the grants that were funded were uh, documentaries, puppet shows, um, uh, entertainment of various types. We put in a research grant to explore um, Alaska Native involvement in the statehood movement, and our angle on this was to do so through the Alaska Native Brotherhood records, primarily backed up by interviews with um, people who were of an age to be politically active during the 1990s, or 1950s, excuse me. Um, initially, I wrote, I wrote this grant with the idea that Andy Hope would be the um, uh, sort of the motivator, the uh, guy in charge of this grant, and um, and we were informed that we did receive the grant in about May, and um, about a month later, Andy was diagnosed with terminal cancer, and he was um, passed away in early August. So that kind of sent us reeling for several months. Um, as I wrote in the program uh, about my relationship with Andy, I got so when we were working on a project, um, I would just expect his phone calls about, is it done yet? <laughs> and on this project, unfortunately, I don't have Andy as a motivator here, but um, we have had the um, opportunity through this grant to begin exploring the records of the Alaska Native Brotherhood. And I think we, um, we're very lucky and smart to do this because um, although the the records of the Alaska Native Brotherhood Grand Camp are somewhat scattered, there are some substantial archives that we've been accessing, and um, one of the most substantial is that of um, uh, William Paul Sr. and his sons, William Paul Jr. and Fred Paul. And, um, and then Kim and I were in Seattle just kind of coincidentally, but we took the opportunity to visit with Francis Paul, who was... Um, William Paul's daughter, and she's now in her, her 80s, but still very much uh, going strong. And it's just for people who've been involved in research like we have, it's, um, it's quite an opportunity not only to meet people who were there during a particular period you're researching, but then to have them, in response to a question, go into a closet and bring out a box full of records nobody's seen in 50 years. And so we've, we've been getting some of that. and. Um, it led to some initial uh, sort of understandings about what was happening and one of the things you have to do as a researcher is to put aside what you, um, your prejudices of the present day, what we think we know and, and by looking at the letters that are written back and forth and in those days 
Um, it's pretty amazing. They kept uh, carbons of the letters they wrote, and then copy you know the originals of the letters they received. And these guys, because there wasn't you know internet or any of these easy ways of communicating, it was all by letter, and um, and they had voluminous records. And so you can really track these issues. And one of the first things that really fascinated us was how deeply involved they were in the issues of the day. And so that led to our first realization, which was we titled the grant Alaska Native Involvement in Statehood. And recently, we've changed that title to um, Alaska Native Response to sh Statehood, because we were finding very little involvement. And from the perspective of the Alaska Native Brotherhood Grand Camp, this was unusual, because in those days, from you know, certainly from the 1920s through the 1960s, this organization was at the forefront of every major issue of the day, and they were not shy about expressing their opinions. But um, a couple of the strands that we f that we are currently pursuing, and we're still really in the middle of this grant, and I'm hoping that some of you out here who were um, mature enough in those days. Uh, in the 1950s when the statehood movement was happening that if any of this sparks a, a remembrance or a comment that you would share with us after our, our presentation. But um, there was several kind of conflicting strands of um, uh, response to this uh, statehood movement. And one was the fishermen who were largely for it because they saw this as a direct way to get the removal of the fish traps and and you know we all I've been hearing about fish traps for years but it's been s somewhat hard for me to conceptualize what was really going on but in a nutshell what was happening was the fish traps were owned by the canneries they were a cheap efficient way of gathering fish for the canneries but what what it meant to fishermen of the day the people who had uh, sane boats and their families and um, friends were fishing for them, and they were highliners. And you know, it was a, uh, you know one of the things that um, Steve Langdon would bring to the table if he was here. And I should have mentioned this at the outset. Steve Langdon, who's a professor of anthropology in Anchorage University of Alaska, Anchorage, was going to be here, but um, the volcano made a um, uh, stranded him in a Anchorage, so he's not going to join us. But Steve has done some real interesting research on um, how socially important sane boat fishermen were for each village. And many of the people here who were raised in the village that don't need me to tell you what how, how important they were at the time. Uh, the Highliners were heroes, and um, but at the time when there were fish traps, it was a very strong competition with commercial fishermen of the day. So fishermen were very much in favor of statehood because it was a promise and one that was ultimately fulfilled to abolish fish traps. And it was one of the first things that the new state government did. So it's not surprising to find that people who were actively involved in commercial fisheries of the day were strongly in f favor of statehood. But in researching the Alaska Native Brotherhood Grand Camp archives, what we find is the leaders of the day were deeply involved in pursuing other avenues. And one of the most interesting, which uh, Kathy Kolkhorst Reddy will speak to uh, in some detail, is the whole reservation issue. And the Native community was deeply conflicted on that because um, reservations the fact that there wasn't, weren't reservations here was something of a point of pride to Alaska Native people. But on the other hand, it was the only way, and it was the only way by which Alaska Natives were going to get title in any form to any large amount of land at that time. This was long before, as you, you know, the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act of 1971. And the the thought of Alaska Natives acquiring title to large blocks of land, much desired by Alaska Natives as you know an obvious um, injustice that they were denied, but to cannery interests, to territorial hunters, to the white establishment, it was anathema. 
they hated the idea of reservations. And at the same time, you had this large population of Alaska Natives who were re really conflicted over it because they did not want to end up on reservations, and there was a deep fear of that. On the other hand, the Alaska Native leadership knew that this was the only avenue by which they were actually going to get title. Because the one thing that, you know, I, I know it's something of a um, misconception about the Clinkett and Haida claims, and Ed was on target here, but uh, I hear people talk about it. And this was, you know, a lawsuit that was, uh, um, the Clinkett people were enabled by Congress, and I believe it was 1935, to press the lawsuit, which did not get really filed until about 1947. But when I hear people talking about it, the tongue slips and they're talking about land claims. It wasn't really land claims. What it was was land comp compensation for lost lands. The U.S. Court of Claims, by which that case was pursued, could not award title to land. It could only compensate for lost lands. So it was going to be a dollar amount. And I won't get into the detail on that, except for the fact that the hope was at the time, the figure I've seen cited is $77 million, which is close to a billion dollars in today's dollars in compensation for the lost lands. That did not come to fruition, largely because a big part of the claim was uh, lost fishing rights, which the court of claims said, you didn't lose anything, it's still public domain. You can, uh, you can still access the fish, you're not prohibited from fishing. So on the land, it ended up being in inevitably a paltry settlement of $7.5 million, which was finally awarded 20 years after the lawsuit was filed in 1968. So um, this whole struggle for land developed over a long period of time, but what became apparent to those who were following the issue was the only way to get to title to land was going to be reservations, and as Ed pointed out, Native communities were conflicted over that because, uh, you know, one, one of the things I came across in this research is, was a reference to uh, concentration camps, and um, that's the level of fear some people had was they were going to be herded onto a reservation, and um, whereas the leadership could see their way through it, it was incredibly complicated issue, but they could see that they might get title to reserves, which would be a whole different thing, where they would have actual title to the land, but um, would not be required to live within a confined um, place on the map. So that that was, you know, one major strand this this whole reservation land uh, issue, and then the the other strand really was sort of the post-war generation that was. Um, generally pro-statehood because they were so patriotic. You know, I mean, this is my father's generation, and my brother here is here, my sister's here. Here, We met those people. They were guests in our house. The, the people who came out of World War II as um, servicemen. And if you had asked any of them, and I've asked some, you know, through the, my interviews, Alaska Native veterans of World War II, you know, they, there was no question. They were for statehood. So here you have these sort of th three different strands. You got commercial fishermen, very pro. The Alaska Native leaders, uncertain, and the uh, post-war generation, generally pro-statehood, but nobody's really committing to it. And as a consequence, when you look at the Alaska Native Brotherhood Grand Camp records and look at the the uh, resolutions passed each uh, convention, and usually it was in a number of 150 to 200 resolutions that were introduced, and maybe 70 to 80 that were actually acted upon and passed or rejected. Very few resolutions pertain to statehood. A, a lot pertain to wage and labor, um, education, sanitation, um, fish traps. Um, so while this was one of the major issues of the day from post-war through 1959 that occupied the time and energy of the um, largely white uh, Alaskan establishment. There was very little activity coming out of the Alaskan Native Brotherhood Grand Camp, and that's 
what we're continuing to pursue our research on is um, to find out, you know, a little more deeply the um, uh, reasons for this, you know, lack of involvement and not a very strong response. Um, and another thing that, you know, I think informs this whole process as to why um, Alaska Natives were not much more involved in statehood than they were is um, there was also the um, the whole citizenship question. And this backs up to the, the days in which Alaska Natehood, Native Brotherhood was formed. Their initial impulse as, um, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Ellen Hope Hayes um, talked about last night at the banquet. Um, when they formed, it was um, competence, citizenship, and Christianity, the three C's, which informed their organization. And they were really pushing for full rights of citizenship. It wasn't until after that was attained, at least partially in 1924, that they began looking at uh, acquiring compensation for land. And one of the, my first publishing projects back in 1981 was the uh, organizational history of the Clinkett Haida Central Council. And it was then that in my research that I came across the quote by, you know, by William Paul Sr. of when he talked to Peter Simpson, one of the primary founders of the Alaska Native Brotherhood, and Peter whispered in his ear and said, William, fight for the land, it's yours. And in this explanation following the quote as remembered by William Paul, he said he was reluctant to bring that issue forward because of the fears that the Alaska Natives had that it might compromise their attainment of full citizenship. So it wasn't until 1929 that this really was brought forward. And I think part of that, you know, being a citizenship means you're one of a body politic. You're not someone who stands aside or is in somehow different. And so I think that was a, um, a part of the reluctance of Alaska Natives to deal real directly with the land issue because, again, the land issue was just intricately tied up with the reservation question. And reservations, many, you know, of everyday Native, blue-collar Natives thought of reservations as being something where you would accept the second-class citizenship, and that simply was off the table. So that complicated the issue. But that's about where we're at in our research. We're, if any of you take issue with anything I say, I've said so far, I'd be, I, I really want to talk to you because um, this is just speculation. Some of it, it's informed speculation. I've read a lot of the correspondence between the native leaders of the day, but. But, um, you know, it's whenever you're doing research, you're uh, somewhat hostage to the records. And, um, and you know, so, some of the, the leaders, the Paratoviches, were pretty good about it. But and, and those of you sitting in this audience, I know you know that the Paratoviches and the, uh, the Pauls were somewhat polar opposites politically. So you have these different sources by which you can begin to put together the history. But... You know, there's many people who didn't keep records, so, um, you know, we're kind of um, at that point where we're trying to ferret out whatever additional information might be available to us. So, with that in mind, uh, Kathy, is that operational? Um, it's connected, but we don't know how to make it. Okay. I think we'll have Kim come up for a moment, and I'll h help work through the technical details. My sister Kim here is uh, long involved in Alaska Native Sisterhood Camp 2. She wrote the history of that organization. She's going to speak a little bit about her research. Thank you, Peter. And uh, hello, everybody. 
My um, clinkant name is Yonda Yane. I was adopted by the late Stella Martin, and um, I carry her name. I'm very proud of that fact, and um, I am also very aware of the responsibility that uh, holding such a name carries. Um, Stella was a Sogway D, uh, the Yellow Cedar House. The research I've done for this project has been pretty minimal. Um, Peter asked me to help out on the project and I'm happy to do so. Um, I found it quite frustrating because uh, my focus was on the A and B uh, minutes, the Grand Camp, and um, then I got into Camp Two's minutes because Camp Two uh, was such a politically active camp. Um, the frustration for me was that I haven't had enough time to do a lot of research. I work uh, an eight to five job as a union rep, and so that's pretty um, time consuming, and getting time off to do this research has been difficult. But when I have been there at the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute, um, going over Walter Soboloff's wonderful collection, um, I, I'm just absolutely thrilled to be doing it because you're actually, you're holding the minutes, um, the, the original minutes that came out of the Grand Camp uh, conventions and uh, the local camp minutes. Some of them are handwritten, some of them are typed. Um, but, you know, as someone that has done a lot of um, oral history, I find that they segue so beautifully into uh, the stories that the women of Camp Two told me for the Sisterhood book that, um, and, and they really bolster uh, the facts that the sisters talked about, what was going on in those days. Um, and as far as statehood, uh, Peter has talked a lot about um, what was going on um, in the Native community in those days, and I would just have to reiterate that, that the um, Alaska Native Brotherhood, in the minutes I've read, starting from 1945 through uh, the mid-50s, well, actually, into 50, as, as late as 59 when statehood actually took place. Um, they reflect that, that the uh, Brotherhood was not totally focused, I mean, well, focused very little on Alaska statehood. They were focused, of course, on the land suit, um, fish traps, education, um, labor issues. That was one thing I found interesting um, was the labor connection. One of the ladies, uh, when I interviewed people, talked about how if you went out to work in a cannery, I think it was in Angoon, you had to pay dues to the sisterhood to work in the cannery. And I'm thinking, what's that all about? And in, in the reading of the minutes, I found out that the AFL and, and CIO, which were two separate organizations in those days, were um, working with the AMB to try and organize the fisheries in Alaska. And I was unaware of that, that there was this real connection there. So. Um, and I found reading through the minutes, as I said, um, all these various connections that had come up in conversations uh, with the sisters doing the book. Um, the one one thing I recall talking about um, in the interviews I did uh, was with Julie uh, Williams, Julie Matsu Williams. And she had talked about um, the effect that statehood had on her family. And this was um, borne out in the minutes, uh, references to land being taken away from families because of statehood. And she said in the interview that um, the family that she was raised by, the, um, she was raised by the Andersons um, after her parents died. Um, the Andersons, I'll just quote from what Julie said um, in the interview I did with her. The Wises, she's talking about uh, Johnny and Lizzie Wise, the Andersons in my family, the Watson family, had three cabins, three houses there. And she's talking about Bug Island on um, Seymour Canal. They used to hunt and they fished and trapped. When we became a state, my uncle Henry said, the government asked them not to go back there. They took the land away from them. The Watson family lived there year round. In fact, the children didn't go to school because of that. It was a lot of years, it wasn't just a few years. But when statehood came, they said, you can't stay on this land, it's a state. These were people that never had an education, didn't go to school, they taught themselves. Henry taught himself to read and his wife to write her name, to sign her name. Um, and those were some people that were directly affected by statehood by the new state taking their land away. 
Um, I know that there was quite a bit of that went on that these, um, these seasonal camps uh, were taken over um, after statehood. Um, that was one thing that uh, I found. Um, Peter also talked about the interview that we did with Frances Paul de Germain in Seattle. Um, she, she's a real character for those of you that, that know her, but um, she's very passionate about uh, her father and her family's involvement in uh, the Alaska Native Brotherhood. And um, for me, that was really uh, one of the high points of my research was getting to talk to her and talk to a direct link with all this history. Um, I am really anxious to do more of this, this kind of research, um, and I'm hoping that I'll be able to get more time away from my day job, as they say. Um, I'd encourage those of you that are interested in this to check out Sea Alaska Heritage Institute's uh, collections. They're very accessible. They allow us to go in there um, from the time they open in the morning, um, and they do make you take the lunch hour off so they can go have lunch too, but you can basically sit in there all day and they'll bring you the boxes and you can just read through. Um, they've got a wonderful collection of minutes uh, from the A and B, uh, as I said, the Grand Camp and the local camps. Um, I did find that in 1947 there was a resolution 14 demanding protection of native rights under the Alaska Statehood Bill. Um, Another fun thing about this is that you read um, exactly what was going on with the, the characters involved. Um, as you know, William Paul Sr. Um, was a controversial person. Um, in, in these minutes of November 15th, 1947, he tenders his resignation um, because he said that uh, there was a vote from the executive committee. Uh, the result of an election was, in effect, a lack of confidence. Uh, he expressed the belief that no person who was not supported by a majority should remain in office, else it might soon happen that persons representing only a minority would be managing the Brotherhood. So you, you're reading about these fights that were going on within the Alaska Native Brotherhood at the time, um, you know, in the minutes that the Grand Camp, or the, that the, this was, um, yeah, that the Executive Committee uh, put together about their meetings. And... Um, this was the same meeting at which this resolution number 14 was adopted. Um, there was a motion by um, William Paul, by William Paul Jr. Um, and Roy Paratrovich to adopt this statehood amendment, and it carried. Um, there are other um, resolutions that are interesting: abolition of the Tongass National Forest. Um, whereas we favor reasonable conservation of our forests on the basis of perpetual yield, yet control the key areas of Alaska by absentee bureaucrats has gone far beyond conservation and has choked off the settlement of our territory by homesteaders, etc. So um, you tend to get caught up in this research, and uh, I, I could sit there, I mean, the hours fly by, and, you know, I find that um, I, instead of concentrating on statehood, I'm going, going off in all these different directions, but I guess that's the, um, where you have to pull yourself in and use some discipline when you're researching. So I have had a real good time so far doing this and I um, expect to do more and try and uh, finish this project out. But um, I will support what Peter has said that um, much of the focus of the ANB in those days was not on statehood but on the land, the land suit um, on, on local issues, there was a tide flat suit here in Juneau that was of particular interest to Camp 2, um, educational equality for the kids, um, some basic uh, breakwater type of issues. I mean, real local kind of issues were what was um, taking up their attention rather than statehood. So with that, I'll end it, and um, I'm hoping that Kathy's got her presentation ready to go. Thank you. Okay, thank you. My name is Kathy Colcorst Ruddy, and I'm very pleased to be working on this project. Um, I'm an attorney by training and on sabbatical, and so I hope that some of the research that we've been able to do uh, provides you with um, information for your consideration about the history of uh, the A and B um, at statehood. 
I have a few slides from the uh, Vilda collection that I'll be showing you that pertain to this. But first of all, I have a couple of thank yous. Um, first of all, to Selaska Heritage Institute for the use of their um, uh, the, the archive room there for Walter Sobolev for donating the 30 boxes of A&B records uh, to Rosita Wuerl for her participation to Zachary Jones, he's the state, he's the archivist there. Uh, and I'd also like to thank uh, Clinkett Readers Incorporated, Dick and Nora Danhauer, Dennis Demert, um, Linda Bellardi, um, and then I also like to recognize and thank um, Ed Thomas and Peter Metcalf and Kim Metcalf. It's uh, been a joy to work on this uh, project. All right, I'll move through these very fast. And these are some of the um, statehood um, images that you may have seen um, recently. This is the ceremony July 4th at the uh, city library, the 49 gun salute, the large flag at the Mendenhall apartment. These are all 1959. These are early 1950s. These are the, um, the, uh, the territorial legislature. Frank Johnson served, Andrew Hope served, and uh, Frank Paratrovich served. Again, territorial legislature. Nineteen fifty-nine. This is the first Alaska state legislature um, after statehood. And again, um, Frank Paratrovich um, in the front row. Nineteen sixty um, was a uh, uh, a year at, right after statehood where. Uh, Alaska's recognition, of, uh, Alaska was a democratic state. Um, this is the, um, uh, I believe this is the A and B float in the statehood parade in Juneau. The um, Contra Costa Posse uh, came up uh, for the event. Again, July 4th, downtown, fireworks. Um, this is uh, William Paul in the center, William Paul Sr. in the center, um, William Paul Jr. Um, on the left, and then Fred Paul um, on the right. This is the um, A and B uh, in 1950, and I use, I've used this as a theme because we are looking at the records that are available, and the records are um, created by the a and B, uh, uh, right here, 1950s was the most tumultuous time. Um, you've heard Ed Thomas talk about um, the issue of reservations. It proved to be the most um, contentious um, issue because it wasn't clear what it meant, and it wasn't clear what the rights would be. Who would, would you have to live on the reservation? Who would own the land? Um, when the Russians, sold um, the land to the Americans, it was a treaty of cession. It was whatever rights the Russians had were conveyed to the Americans. So the, the uh, questions were enormous. Uncertainties abounded, lack of clarity. Um, this is uh, William Paul Sr. and Richard Stitt on the right. Uh, this is Al Widmark. I'm sorry, I'm not. I'm not, I don't know exactly how to do that. You'll have to make do with his eyes, I guess. <laughs> just I'll just keep on going. Yeah. I'm just trying to give you a flavor. This is all available on the internet. It's Vilda, V-I-L-D-A, and you, it's, you're, you're going into the digital archives of the state of Alaska. I put that in because it just made me happy to see. I don't know the, I don't know the people and the players here, but these were the people who were trying to make the decision um, as to what statehood meant. Should they support it? Should they oppose it? Should they be neutral and just watch and see who came out? 
Um, as Ed indicated, these are the founders of the Alaska Native Brotherhood in 1912, uh, the first civil rights organization uh, in the United States, and this was the political organization that was uh, receiving the information from Washington, D.C. Um, as all of these, there, there seem to be, to me, about 12 different versions of the statehood bill, and every time the word came back, it was the um, descendants of the, uh, these people and the A and B who were trying to make sense of it. And this is the Alaska Native Brotherhood um, section of the Juno Parade in 1959. Um, this is uh, Governor Egan in the center of a, uh, um, a group that includes Benny Benson. Um, this is, again, the um, um, Clinkett float in the 1959 parade. Um, I'm going to skip over the um, acts that we have here. I have the Treaty of Session. Um, I have the uh, 19... Um, uh, 45 anti-discrimination bill. Um, I have the Organic Act, first and second, that um, were the foundation of legal um, principles for the territory and then the state, but I'm going to um, skip over these. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, Benny Benson on the left uh, with the flag that he designed um, with then uh, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if Governor if Greening was governor at that time. Um, and then these are other um, slides. Just one second. I think I have one or two others in this section that I wanted to call to your attention. Oh, okay. Um, this is. Um, Charlie Jones, uh, sh uh, who was called uh, Chief Shakes the Seventh, and he was the person who uh, was the plaintiff in the lawsuit brought by William Paul in 1924 um, for um, voting rights. I'm sure you've heard the story that uh, he was um, arrested for having voted when he was not eligible to vote, and um, Mrs. Tamry, William Paul's mother, um, encouraged the, um, uh, the the issue, and William Paul brought the um, brought the suit, um, which was successful, um, and the um, uh, recognized the uh, right of the native people to vote. <coughs> Salvation Army, um, and this is um, Cyrus Peck. Uh, senior on the left and Andrew Gamble uh, on the right. The letters um, that Kim has talked about being so captivating, if you sit in the Alaska Heritage Institute archives, you can read letters from um, Cyrus Peck Sr., William Paul, Andrew Hope um, about these major issues. And Okay, this is the um, old A&B Hall in 1975. Okay, and I'll, I'll leave us with the anti-discrimination um, bill that I think you're all familiar with. Let me try to summarize. I've created a chronology um, of relevant dates, and please, if you're interested in it, we're going to be posting this on the Alaska Native Knowledge um, Network, I believe, and uh, or ask me for a copy. I would be very pleased, and I'll just try to hit the highlights so you can understand some of the background of the the legal principles on which this huge d debate um, was uh, was joined all through the 1950s. Um, the debate was um, how, what should statehood look like, who would own the land. Um, the Russians claimed this um, area and they um, asserted jurisdiction by the fact that Bering and Chirikov had landed here um, then in 1867, as I indicated before, it was a treaty of cession. Um, the Russians did not claim ownership. It wasn't like a warranty deed. It was a quitclaim deed. They, it was a, they ceded to the um, uh, Americans whatever it was that they 
um, that they had. Um, in 1884, there was an organic act which extended the mining laws to Alaska and it provided, this is an important quote, that the Indians or other persons in said district shall not be disturbed in the possession of any lands actually in their use or occupation or now claimed by them, but the terms under which such person may acquire title to such lands is reserved for future legislation by Congress. 1906, there was an Allotment Act. 1912, the Alaska Native Brotherhood was formed, and the second Organic Act was passed. It extended the federal constitution and the federal laws to Alaska, and it provided for a system of government, which was an elected territorial legislature and a delegate without vote back to Washington, D.C. The first territorial legislature convened. One of the first things they did was grant voting rights to women, but of course, that was only non-indigenous women who were um, uh, recognized to, to uh, be able to vote. Uh, in 1915, according to um, the article by Rosita Worrell, the territorial legislature allowed natives to acquire citizenship. This is 1915 but there were several fairly onerous conditions that they sever tribal relations, adopt habits of civilization, pass an exam by the town teachers, secure endorsements of five white residents, and satisfy the district judge. That was 1915. In 1916, Wickersham uh, introduced the first statehood bill. Um, in 1924, as it's been indicated, con Congress granted citizenship to all Indians um, and that included, of course, uh, um, uh, it included Alaska uh, Indians, but it did not terminate tribal rights and property. Um, in 1929, the Grand Camp of the A and B in Haines formalized the bill that became known as the, they uh, 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 accepted the uh, suit for the Court of Claims to recognize the ownership of the land that was taken away when President Roosevelt uh, signed into being the uh, Tongass National Forest, and I forget what year um, that was, but um, in any event, it, it took that much time for the A and B to make that uh, decision. Um, then uh, in uh, the, the Clinton Haida Central Council was established, the Indian Reorganization Act was passed and then extended to Alaska. World War II, um, it, it, the, the impact of World War II can't be um, uh, overestimated, I don't think. Uh, it was clear that um, suddenly the, the, we were all actors on the world stage. Last night, Ellen Hope Hayes, in her talk, uh, spoke about um, the, the, the twin threats of the Ice Age was the threat that she indicated first and then was the threat of colonialization. And it, it, there, are, there are other threats that will come to us um, from the outside. We need to, be, we need to remain alert. And um, in 1942, the Japanese bombed Dutch Harbor and then invaded Kiska and Attu. And the native people served in this war and all other wars with great distinction and valor, disproportionate um, to their numbers. Um, in the middle of the war, um, Wickersham indicated that because of the territory's service uh, uh, to the nation uh, during the war, that was an indication that the territory was ready uh, for statehood. Uh, in 1945, as has been discussed before, the um, Anti-Discrimination Act recognized um, that there be no racial discrimination in places of business um, in, in schools, um, in, um, I I housing, uh, very important, uh, significant development. Uh, then in 1946, Congress authorized the, uh, this Indian Claims Commission Act so that the land that had been taken away could be addressed. As Peter was saying, there was never a claim that the land be returned under the Court of Claims lawsuit it was a money compensation for the loss of the land. The Court of Claims did not have authority under for fee simple for the title of the land. Um, 
The suit was filed by James Curry in 1947. Um, the first statehood bill was uh, the first statehood bill of the of the intense time was introduced in 1950. The Grand Camp Convention was in Craig. Greening came. Uh, Curry came, and there was much confusion and dispute over this idea of a legislation to block the authority for reservations. Um, I can't go into the detail now because the time, but I urge you to contact any of us or stay with us afterwards so that we can discuss this. And again, I urge you to um, correct us if there's anything that we are saying that is incorrect. What we know of is the paper, uh, also the internet, I suppose, now the paper is digitized, and also the uh, people that we have interviewed, but we invite and, and solicit your participation uh, in this project. Um, 1951, um, the, um, the major, dis there was the major bill was called 4388, and it had a, what William Paul re referred to as a joker in it, and the joker was that it meant that um, within two years, you had to apply for land or it would be forfeited. It was a very um, um, nefarious uh, uh, section, and um, it, it showed, I think, the, the alert that uh, William Paul and Curry sent out, uh, James Curry sent out, was that the Alaska Native Brotherhood needed to pay attention, careful attention, to the, 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 the seemingly insignificant provisions of these statehood acts. And as I said before, they were changing every six months. So it took a lot of brain cells to pay attention to them. Um, uh, then the Grand Camp Conventions, we, we've read the minutes and the resolutions from the Grand Camp Conventions for 15 years. Um, 1952, Huna was a very exciting one. Um, 1954 was Angoon, and that was after the Tihitan lawsuit, which I'd be delighted to explain, to talk about if anyone is interested. That was after, in 1954, President Eisenhower um, referred to statehood for Hawaii, but not for Alaska. Um, by the way, 1952, the Republicans were swept in. <coughs> Um, President Eisenhower came in, and the House and Senate, which had been Democratic before that, were suddenly Republican. So if you're sitting here in Southeast Alaska trying to understand who's in power, which way's up, you, you have another layer of complexity there. You have the issue with the, um, with the unions. You have the Republicans versus the Democrats. You have multiple um, uh, issues, uh, multiple groups that you have to try to understand. Uh, 1955 was Petersburg, and the Tihitan lawsuit had been decided by then. Um, the, um, then, I think, as uh, you all know, in 55, the Constitutional Convention uh, got started up in Fairbanks. Uh, in 1956, the, um, there was a statewide vote for this Constitution, and the vote was, um, my memory, 9,000 to 6,000. Um, Native people voted in that vote. Um, I have not heard of any um, organized campaign uh, from the Alaska Native Brotherhood, either pro or con, in that uh, vote in 1956. Uh, then, in 1959, the Court of Claims, you know, it had been 12 years since that lawsuit was filed, so during the entire period of time when the um, statehood bills are changing every six months, it wasn't clear whether there would be any recompense for not just the taking of the land, but the timber and the fisheries as well. So 1959, the Court of Claims rules that the Tlingit and Haida tribes occupied the land under aboriginal title at the time of session. That was a key decision because up until then it wasn't even clear that that court would rule in that way. Um, uh, then the, you've, heard, you've heard about the fish traps, um, the, um, the 1968, the final court of claims uh, decision for seven and a half million was compensation for extinguishing the aboriginal title and the fisheries were 
uh, not recognized. In other words, the, 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 there was no ownership in the fisheries recognized. It was for the acreage, and the value of the acreage was taken at some time in the distant past. In other words, it wasn't current fair market value for the, uh, for the land that uh, had been taken. All right, I think I'll close there. Um, just, it's again, it's been a great honor to work on this project. Oh, I also do want to thank the Alaska Humanities Forum and the Rasmussen Foundation that contributed uh, the funds. And again, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you very much. I, I want to thank the uh, panel for all their research and uh, being here today to uh, go through. You can tell they were uh, adopted clinkets because they are long-winded. <laughs> um, I saw Mary Jones back there. I guess she went, she went out, but uh, I was uh, hoping to be able to recognize her before she left. She's the Grand President Emeritus of the Alaska Native Sisterhood in Grand Camp. And uh, I, I did have the honor of interviewing her. And then we have Ellen Hope Hayes here. I inter interviewed her over the phone. Uh, one of the important things that uh, uh, we need to do more work on is to talk to people that were around during the time of statehood and actively involved in their community. Uh, and we try to do some of that, but uh, uh, you can just uh, uh, imagine that uh, some of those that uh, some of those that are still around uh, that were around then were busy pulling their lives together, getting on with their careers, uh, fighting with ex-husbands and things like that. <laughs> uh, so there was a there was really uh, a generation of people that are that are now our elder leaders were really uh, involved in uh, a lot of moving around. That was also an era where we had uh, relocation uh, of our people. Uh, they would go away to go to school and then come back uh, through a relocation plan. Uh, I wanted to uh, close with uh, the comment about uh, the, the issue of uh, state recognition of tribes. You may not be aware, but there are two, over 230 tribes in Alaska. There is no other state that has more federally recognized tribes in it. And we still do not have a, uh, a, uh, a office, uh, a desk, Indian desk, or anything like that. Even some of the small states that have uh, very few tribes, and maybe even no federally recognized tribes like, like Nebraska, they have an Indian desk uh, in the office of the governor. And they also have an Indian commission uh, to uh, g uh, give them guidance. And just imagine that there could be so much uh, positive uh, work uh, generated if we did have uh, a, a partnership with the state to help us deal with some of our major issues. In rural Alaska, I, I think we waste more time uh, debating and arguing over governance uh, than some of our real issues in our rural communities, well, even in some of our urban communities. And so it's a big waste of time for us not to have a strong partnership, meaning the tribal governments having a strong partnership with the state of Alaska. We could do much more for our common citizenry if we had these strong partnerships. Uh, and anyway, I, I just want to close by thanking all of you for sticking it out with us here today. Uh, I know it's been a long day, uh, but I really want to also point out that the, uh, the uh, workshop before us was a very important workshop, and we don't want to downplay that because uh, it really did uh, bring to focus uh, a lot of the things we need to do as a people to hang on to our culture, uh, to make sure we do it the right way. Uh, and, and to uh, move forward uh, with our, uh, what I call our inherent sovereignty, who we really are as a people, uh, is built into the ceremonies that we saw here today. Uh, Mary came walking in. Mary, would you mind waving? Mary is our ANS Grand President Emeritus. I uh, want to give her a hand. And 
a lot of what we do and have done is because of the A and B and A and S, and I want to pay them tribute. With that, uh, once again, thank you, panel, and I thank the uh, the organizers of the workshop for putting this together. Oh, we had a question here, Bob. My name is Bob Apollo, and I'm a good. I was a good friend of Andy Hopes, and Andy taught me a freedom of discussion. It's very important to get idea, our ideas across. I'm not trying to attack you. I respect your position as Lincoln and Haida in SC Alaska. But underneath these discussions, and I can't name people that we have these discussions with because I don't, they didn't give me the authorization to. But the end of this discussion, the, we talked about IRAs, how unique they are with a government-government relationship with the United States. Underneath the Natives Lands Claims Act, the land was taken, the corporation, and the trust fund of the monies was entered to Clinton and Haida. I'm, I'm not trying to bash anything here. What I'm trying to say is these IRAs as tribal governments, to be a tribal government, you have to have a land base. And it would be really nice if Sea Alaska would talk with all these IRAs and say, we'll give you 100 acres of land. You do with it, but it's held underneath trust so you can form a land base. And underneath the trust fund to help them establish a building. You know, all these ideas we throw back and forth because it's a government to government relationship and the role is really not explained. The association between tribal government organizations such as the A and B, IRAs, Lincoln and Haida, Tribes of Alaska, and other ad hoc committees. And we have to put our representatives forward where they can talk for the people, tribal council also. But without a land base, it's pretty hard to, for anybody to take you serious. Do you see in the future that Sea Alaska would give such land to the tribal governments so they can have a land base and try to give some of the uh, trust fund monies to help them establish a good base? Thank you. I, uh, I don't know if all of you heard the question. The, the main major question is whether or not uh, Sea Alaska would be amenable to giving IRA tribes land or so that they can have a land base. And uh, the short answer is no for two reasons. Number one, the biggest reason is because uh, uh, the, uh, the Sea Alaska or any native corporation cannot turn over land to a tribe uh, for the purpose of uh, putting it under trust. That was prohibited in 1988 amendments uh, as a result of the lawsuit with Venati. Uh, the other probably as important is that a corporation like Sea Alaska could not uh, give a, uh, uh, a benefit to one group of shareholders without giving the same benefit to all shareholders. Uh, and that is more of a common law under corporate law than it is under whether it's tribal. Uh, now, as far as the Clinkett and Haida settlement, uh, uh, we do have uh, uh, some remaining funds uh, and and that is managed by the Tribal Council, uh, and it was for settlement of the Clinkett and Haida claims for the Clinkett and Haida people. The one dimension that uh, IRAs have that uh, Clinkett and Haida doesn't have is you have IRAs that are made up of people who are not Clinkett or Haida. Uh, and so we have that other dimension, uh, 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 even within our region, we have uh, people who are not of Clinkett and Haida descendancy uh, and uh, therefore, uh, politically, it probably doesn't work very well. Uh, the issue of land-based tribes is, uh, is uni uniform throughout our, our state as well as in Oklahoma and other states that have tribes that don't have land. I totally agree with you on the, on the, uh, the, the way settlements should really go, is that if Clinkett and Haida, for example, was the plaintiff, uh, and there was a settlement, the land should have gone to Clicken Haida. 
just as you kind of feel that maybe it should go to the IRAs. Uh, and, but in the way that the suits were set up is, uh, uh, is really using non-native law uh, to try to settle Aboriginal claim and it doesn't work for everybody and I think a lot of the framers of that law understood that before it was passed. Uh, setting up uh, a native settlement under state law as they did with corporations uh, really does not satisfy uh, uh, the, uh, the, the reason why our people were into that suit before. Uh, I don't want to drag this out and I, because I, I, I think the longer you talk about it, the more it sounds like a defensive posture. I, I want to let you know that uh, uh, as far as principles go, I think you're right on target. As far as reality and all the laws that uh, have been put into place as well as uh, uh, some of the court cases, uh, many of these things cannot happen. Uh, and so uh, I hope that the explanation is not uh, trying to lead you to feel that I believe that, that what you're saying is wrong. I think what you're saying is right. I'm just trying to let you know what the legal uh, uh, obstacles are. But anyway, thanks for your question. Any more questions? Uh, are you afraid it might take too much time to answer it? Uh, but anyway, thanks again, everybody. I really appreciate you being here, and uh, I do want to uh, I once again thank the panel for a great job. Uh, did a lot of research on our very important issue. Thanks very much. Gunas chish hawa doichin.